<laughs> Former deputy spokesperson for the State Department and Fox News analyst Marie Harf. And joining us in the center seat, Republican Congressman Ron DeSantis of Florida. He is outnumbered. Hi. Welcome, Congressman. Uh, it's great to be here. Yeah, we got a lot Good going on. Glad you're here on a we Monday. We do, we do. Okay, let's scoop. Front and center in the immigration debate is the fate of dreamers, the hundreds of thousands of immigrants who came here illegally as children. But also on the table, Republican requests for more border security and reforms to U.S. immigration system. Then yesterday, new reports, the White House is floating a compromise idea to maintain legal immigration at current levels for more than a decade. Late last night, a group of Republican senators announced a plan that mirrors the president's framework. Any plan to advance it will need 60 votes. That means substantial support from both political parties will be mandatory. Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel is live for us on Capitol Hill. Mike, here we go again. Thunder no and lightning. about it, Harris. Good afternoon to you. Yeah, President Trump sounds hopeful as the Senate begins a critical week tackling immigration. Today, Republican Senators Grassley, Cornyn, Purdue, Tillis, Lankford, Cotton, and Ernst are going to roll out an immigration plan, which looks a lot like what President Trump requested. It would address the young people, fund border security with a wall, end so-called chain migration, and the visa lottery. President Trump weighed in on Twitter over the weekend, writing, Republicans want to fix DACA far more than the Democrats. Democrats do. The Dems had all three branches of, branches of government back in 2008 to 2011, and they decided not to do anything about DACA. They only want to use it as a campaign issue, vote Republican. And in his weekly address, President Trump urged lawmakers to get it done. It's time for Congress to act and to protect Americans. Every member of Congress should choose the side of law enforcement and the side of the American people. That's the way it has to be. A leading House conservative says Congress must deliver what the American people want. What they want is border security first. So build the border security wall in the chain migration. Get rid of this crazy visa lottery. Do things in a way that make good comments. Sanctuary city, city uh, policy. Get rid of those. Do those things first. Then we'll deal with the DACA situation. That is consistent with the mandate of the 2016 election and frankly consistent with what the president and what Republicans campaigned on. The Senate passed a major immigration reform plan back in 2013 with 68 votes in favor, but it did not go anywhere in the House. As the Senate's set to begin this debate, its Democratic leader sounds more anxious about the House side of the Capitol. I also hope that Speaker Ryan will do what Senator McConnell has agreed to do allow a fair and open process to debate a dreamer's bill on the House floor. There is a March 5th deadline to address the so-called dreamers. Supporters of getting this done are hopeful that deadline will deliver a result. Harris. Mike Emanuel, thank you very much. Uh, as we come out to the couch now, Congressman, are we closer than we have ever been before or not? I think time will tell. I think what the Senate is going to do it's probably going to be a lot different than what most of the House Republicans are going to want to do. How different? Well, I mean, for example, the Goodlatte bill, which is kind of the House's version of what we need to do to deal with this. Yes, it ends chain migration. Yes, it does the diversity lottery. It ends that. It also defunds sanctuary cities. It also has E-Verify. And so part of the problem with, you know, go back to the Reagan amnesty, that has incentivized more people to come illegally historically when you do that stuff. If you have E-Verify and you're defunding sanctuary cities, well, what you're doing is you're turning off the incentives to come illegally in the future. And I think that is going to be the difference. Are you doing something that's actually solving the problem going forward, or are you just continuing on this cycle where we're going to be in the same place 10, 15 years in the future? So, Marie, if you keep uh, the immigration, legal immigration levels at where they are for the next decade, which mm -hmm. is something that I would imagine Democrats really want. They don't want to dip in that. Mm -hmm. And you allow any form of amnesty because that's what the president has said that he would sign as well uh, for the dreamers. But you have the E-Verify and the things that the congressman is talking about on balance. Do you think Democrats would go for it? I'm not sure some Republicans in the Senate would go for it. That's going to be a key question. Republicans only have a one vote majority in the Senate. Uh, and you have some folks who I'm not sure would vote for the good lat bill, just candidly. <laughs> Mitch McConnell has kept his cards pretty close to his vest in terms of what he actually wants to see in a Senate bill. And I do think this will be a real test for Donald Trump. He has said he wants to fix this. He has put a compromise on the table that I think a lot of Democrats were surprised that he might. Can he bring the House and the Senate Republicans closer Agreed. to each other? 
Taylor. This will be a test of his presidential leadership. Go on back this. to the president's point in that tweet, though, right, Congressman? He's he's saying, look, uh, Republicans want to fix Tadaka more than more than Democrats do. Look back at all the opportunities that they had to do something about this, and they were not able to get that done. I mean, is there is there a lot of truth to that? Well, I think the reason why they didn't do it when Obama had the 60 votes in the Senate and the House majority is because they know doing some of this is unpopular. I mean, there are a lot of unpopular elements to some of these things. I mean, the Gang of Eight bill, remember, that was a massive increase in unskilled legal immigration in addition to a big amnesty. So if you're looking at some of those states that Trump did well in in the Midwest, that is not something that I think a lot of blue collar folks think is necessarily good for their wages and their jobs. And so that's been the issue. But Tom is actually pretty popular, right? Right? I mean, DACA is pretty popular, comparatively speaking. DACA is popular on both sides because right. people want to protect, uh, you know, oftentimes children who were brought here at very young ages from being deported to countries, you know, they, they might right. have come from when they were young, but they don't have homes there anymore. Uh, then there is bipartisan support for that. There are several areas where there is bipartisan support. Uh, the president is talking about uh, giving amnesty and citizenship, not mm -hmm. just legal protection, mm -hmm. which is, you know, something that Lindsey Graham and some of his cohorts mm -hmm. have been talking talking about, but citizenship to 1.8 million uh, people here. And, and that is a huge number. So there are a lot of gray areas. And I think that's why you're seeing this open Senate debate, yeah. because it's yeah. not as black and white as both sides have framed it for so long. Yeah. And uh, the, the debate is getting more sophisticated. And people are realizing that if you have prohibition on legal immigration, you're going to have more illegal immigration. Right. If you have an entitlement state in this mm. country, which makes it really attractive for people to come here and get free benefits. Fits, you're going to have right. more of that kind of so, hold on one second you're gonna have more of that kind of illegal immigration if you end the entitlement state which Republicans and Democrats are not willing to do you're going to see yeah. a vast shift in immigration in this country and I think that's ultimately what people want the right. system so, that works better. Congressman, when you look yeah. at somebody like a Lamar Smith who says no way to amnesty and you look at others in the house and obviously in your party uh, what is the compromise you know intra-party well, Goodlatte's bill is actually a compromise because it provides some type of regularization for people who have DACA. So they will have basically a non-immigrant visa. Now, what it doesn't allow them is to get citizenship and then do the chain migration right. to bring in the relatives. And so that would be something for those folks um, because part of the DACA stuff, I mean, they were offered this. I think it was illegal what Obama did. But, I mean, all they did was just sign the forms the government offered them. So I think that provision of that recognizes that reliance interest, but it's doing it in a way that I don't think will fuel future waves. Remember, when Obama instituted DACA, what happened that summer of 2014? It created you so had a much border gray surge. area. Absolutely right. I mean, that's one of the gray areas But you had people sending unaccompanied they thought, minors Exactly. They thought the they border. could send kids here and they would achieve. We don't, want to, we don't want to, we don't want to incentivize that. And, and some of those folks were being trafficked, they were being abused. Yeah. I mean, it was really bad. Well, even the detention so, centers on our borders. I mean, we were, we were having a hard time keeping up with that, with yes. these children coming over. So exactly. Congressman, is it fair to say that there's real progress being made? I think we'll see what happens in the Senate. Uh, at a minimum, whatever the Senate comes up with, that's got to get the president's approval. If the president says this is not the w direction he wants to go, then that'll immediately be dead in the House. It's not going to go so anywhere So what happens if wall funding, though, takes uh, a, a turn that it did last time around in 2006, and you have eminent domain that's, lawsuits that, that exactly. hold up some of the wall construction? And that's been the problem with all the immigration debate. The, the promises of future security or enforcement somehow never materialize. So the wall, you're exactly right. Not just authorizing funding, but actually appropriating it. And then you have to override all the other uh, laws for the uh, you know, so that the wall's not held up infinitum. Yeah. And the same thing with the chain migration. I mean, the president's proposal to do chain migration 10 years from now, there's a question about whether that will actually stick yeah. if you do it that far into the future. So Jim Jordan, the, the, right. when you showed him, what Jimmy's saying is, let's get this stuff in place and then do the DACA how, once it's in place. How surprised are you that the conversation, though, I mean, if you look at what we just went through to prevent the government from shutting down, started in the Senate, um, and, and normally it's the House that kind of leads on these issues. What, what, is, what is so difficult about particularly immigration that keeps it in the Senate's hands first now? Well, I think that there's, you know, Paul Ryan made a promise when he became speaker that he would not move immigration that didn't have a majority of Republican uh, votes. And, um, mm. you know, Goodlatte, I think, probably has that. I don't know whether he's for that or not. Um, but I think that 
they've not wanted to do anything in the House that's just going to crater in the Senate. So let's see what they get on, 60 Marie. votes for, and then we'll consider <laughs> it. Come on, get back in here, No, Marie. I don't think the good lab bill has anywhere close to 218. And I think that you, I mean, and look, there are a lot of Republicans in the House who are not running again, who don't have the same concerns about the base, who don't have the same concerns about being primaried, mm -hmm. who, who look at the good lab bill and say, this actually isn't a compromise in the same way that possibly, I mean, E-Verify is, it sounds so, you know, not controversial. It's incredibly controversial. And I don't think that can pass in a Senate bill. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately for Republicans, only having a one vote majority in the Senate makes this conversation a tough one. And the president needs to make clear what his priorities are. Okay, so let me, uh, to that point, let me ask you a question. Is it better on immigration to do what they talked about with health care? Because trying to do it in one giant piece didn't work. All right, I'm going to have to break in with breaking news now. The president is hosting a meeting at the White House on infrastructure. It was supposed to begin that way. And then it ranged into many, many more topics. Let's watch if together. You want it badly, you're going to get it. And if you don't want it, that's okay with me, too. But we have to rebuild our infrastructure. You know, I said this morning, as of a couple of months ago, we have spent $7 trillion in the Middle East. Seven trillion dollars. What a mistake. And, but it is what it is. This is what I took over. And we're trying to build roads and bridges and fix bridges that are falling down. And we have a hard time getting the money. It's crazy. But think of that. As of a couple of months ago, seven trillion dollars in the Middle East. And the Middle East is far worse now than it was 17 years ago when they went in. And not so intelligently, I have to say, went in. I'm being nice. So it's a very sad thing. Uh, the budget was recently passed, and the reason it was passed is because of our military. Our military was totally depleted, and we will have a military like we've never had before. We're going to have an incredible military. And to me, uh, that means a couple of things. Number one, it, it does mean jobs, but really, number one, it means safety and security. Because without the military, and we may have very strong views on spending, which I have, but without the military, it's possible there's no reason for us to be meeting. Maybe we wouldn't be here. So we're going to have the strongest military we've ever had by far. We're increasing arsenals of virtually every weapon. We're modernizing and creating brand new, a brand new nuclear force. And frankly, we have to do it because others are doing it. If they stop, we'll stop. But they're not stopping, so if they're not going to stop, we're going to be so far ahead of everybody else in nuclear like you've never seen before. And I hope they stop. And if they do, we'll stop in two minutes. And frankly, I'd like to get rid of a lot of them. And if they want to do that, we'll, we'll go along with them. We won't lead the way. We'll go along with them. But we will have... And one understands, and the people in this room really understand better than most, probably, hopefully, better than anybody, that the problem that the states have and local leaders have with funding the infrastructure is horrendous. And uh, we will build, we will maintain, and the vast majority of Americans want to see us take care of our infrastructure. Uh, trucking companies are complaining that they used to take trucks from Los Angeles to New York and there was no damage. Now they bring from Los Angeles to New York and there's tremendous damage to their trucks because our roads are in bad shape and we're going to get the roads in great shape. And very important, we're going to make our infrastructure uh, modernized and uh, we're really way behind schedule. We're way behind other countries. We always led the way for many, many years. Then a number of decades ago, it slowed down and over the last eight years and 15 years, to be honest, it's uh, come to a halt. This morning, I submitted legislative principles to Congress that will spur the biggest and boldest infrastructure investment in American history. The framework will generate an unprecedented $1.5 to $1.7 trillion investment in American infrastructure. We're going to have a lot of public-private, and that way it gets done on time, on budget. It will speed the permit approval process from 10 years to two years and maybe even to one year. Because when we give you as governors and mayors and people representing your great states, so we give you money and you can't get your approvals, I guess we're going to have to take that money back or you're not going to build. 
And some of you are sitting around the table that I know, some of the governors, you're going to get those permits, I have no doubt. Others, I see a couple sitting around the table, I don't think they're going to get their permits so fast. But you're going to have to get it, otherwise you're not going to be able to build. Because we can't give you money and you're going to take 15 years to get a permit. In one state, it took 17 years for a basic roadway to get a permit. And the cost was many, many, many times what it was supposed to be. And we can't have that. So we want you to get going and you'll work on the permitting process. And from a federal standpoint, environmentally and everything we have to do, I see Scott is here. Uh, we're going to get you permits very quickly. It provides $50 billion for rural infrastructure who have really been left out. The rural folks have been left out, including broadband internet access, which they don't have and they want it and the farmers want it. It will create thousands and thousands of jobs and increase training for our great American workers. And it returns power to the state and local governments who know best what their people need. Washington will no longer be a roadblock to progress. Washington will now be your partner. Will be your partner. A lot of money, up to 1.7 trillion, that's bigger than people thought. And we're gonna have a lot of great people working. We're gonna also have great companies investing and building, and they'll build for you, because sometimes the states aren't able to do it like we can do it, or like other people can do it, or like I used to do it. When I uh, did the Wallman Rink, it was seven years, they couldn't get it built. It would have been forever, they couldn't get it built. And I did it in a few months at a much smaller price. They had invested $12 million in building an ice skating rink in the middle of Central Park. Took somebody told me about this the other day. They've never forgotten it. It was a big deal at the time. It remains a big deal. Uh, took many, many years, and they were unable to open it. And I said, you know, I'd like to be able to have my daughter, Ivanka, who is with us, I'd like to be able to have her go ice skating sometime before she doesn't want to ice skate. <laughs> and uh, I got involved, and I did it in a few months, and we did it for a tiny fraction, tiny fraction of the cost. And it's really no different with a roadway. It's no different with a bridge or tunnel or any of the things that we'll be fixing. The returns of, of money and, and investment to the states and local government will be incredible. And nobody knows better than you people where you want the money invested. That's the other thing. For the federal government to say, gee, this is what we want you to do in Wisconsin, Scott. Uh, you know exactly where you want to do it, and you've done a great job, by the way, but you know exactly where that money is going. And uh, how is your new company that's opening up there doing, by the way? Are they doing okay? That was a big one. Foxconn that's moving along, right? They make the Apple iPhone, and uh, I said for a long time, I said, I want those companies to be making their product here, and they went to Wisconsin. Scott did a fantastic job of presentation. I actually saw a site that I loved. I said, that was an old auto site. And I was with the head of Foxconn, great man, actually, great businessman, incredible. And I said, that's a great site for you, right in Wisconsin. And I hear that's where they're going. So you've done a fantastic job. But this is a common sense and bipartisan plan that every member of Congress should support. I look forward to working with them. And uh, we're going to get the American people roads that are fixed and bridges that are fixed. And if for any reason they don't want to support it, hey, that's going to be up to them. Uh, what was very important to me was the military. What was very important to me was the tax cuts. And what was very important to me was regulation. This is of great importance, but it's not nearly in that category, because the states will have to do it themselves if we don't do it. But I would like to help the states out, and we're doing that with a very big investment. One of the other things I think so important to mention is that in the budget, uh, we took care of the military like it's never been taken care of before. In fact, General Mattis called me, he goes, wow, I can't believe I got everything we wanted. I said, that's right, but we want no excuses. We want, we want you to buy twice, okay? Twice what you thought for half the price. <laughs> so maybe we're gonna get involved a little bit in the buying. We wanna get twice as many planes for half the price. And believe me, we can, we can do a lot because the procurement process is very outdated, to put it nicely but we're gonna have something very special. But one of the things that was very important to me with respect to the budget was DACA. I did not want DACA in the budget. I wanted DACA separate so that we could talk about it and make a deal. And I hope to be able to make a deal. I hope the Democrats are not gonna use it 
just as a campaign. You know, they've been talking about DACA for many years, and they haven't produced. We started talking about DACA, and I think we'll produce. But if the Democrats want to make a deal, it's really up to them. Because we want really tremendous border security, but we have to have Democrat support for DACA. And they are starting that process today. We didn't want to have it in the big budget, because if we have it in the big budget, it's going to get mixed up with all of the other things. So now we have our military taken care of, and now we start very serious DACA talks today. And we are, I can tell you, speaking for the Republican Party, we would love to do DACA. We would love to get it done. We want border security and the other elements that you know about, chain migration you know about, the visa lottery you know about. But we think there's a good chance of getting DACA done if the Democrats are serious and they actually want to do it. But they didn't want tax cuts. They fought, we didn't get one vote for massive tax cuts that have turned out to be unbelievably popular. And what came up, which was even a surprise to us, were the big companies stepped up and millions and millions of people have gotten tremendous bonuses. Nobody knew that was going to happen. That was a, that was just the beginning point. So we didn't get one Democrat vote, not one for the biggest tax. And I think that's a big political problem for them. You know, if you want to know the truth, they are going around saying they made a mistake because the tax cuts have now, you see what's going on. It's spurred the economy. Unemployment is at virtually record lows. Black unemployment is at the lowest level in history. Hispanic unemployment is at the lowest level in recorded history, which is really something that's so great. And we are very, very, it's amazing what's been, what's been going on with the economy. And I just want to uh, end by saying it's an honor to have all of you with us. We're going to have a few of you make statements and then we'll all stay around. If you want, we can leave the press or we can have the press leave immediately. I'll leave that up to Scott Walker because you're going to be the first speaker. So, Scott, do you want to say a few words? Sure. And thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Well, first off, Mr. President, I think on behalf of all of us, all the state and local leaders, both Republican and Democrat alike, thank you to you and your administration for, for hosting us all today. Before you came in, we were having a good and lively discussion about uh, answering some of the questions many of us had. Uh, you alluded to a moment ago, uh, Foxconn, which uh, you were great to help us announce uh, here, uh, as I mentioned to many of the folks assembled here today, uh, for the first time ever, LCD panels, the kind of panels here, in the future, they'll be even bigger. Uh, right. Made by Sharp will be made in the in the United States, and we're proud that they'll be made in the state of Wisconsin. About a $10 billion investment. We're helping with about $3 billion worth of incentives. And uh, when we think about infrastructure, it ties into that as it does all over the state of Wisconsin. Uh, in the last few years, in our through this recent budget, we've made about a 24. Uh, million or billion dollar investment in our state in the transportation infrastructure. Uh, that's about three billion dollars more than the previous eight years. And so we understand what you're trying to do here. But one of those projects that will help there is uh, it's about a one and a half, almost one point six billion dollar uh, transportation project, Interstate 94 from the state line through Kenosha, Racine counties, all the way up to our largest county, Milwaukee County. Uh, we've completed a good chunk of it. I think uh, uh, 13 of the 19 interchanges have been completed. About half of the miles have been done. But there's one major portion right by where they're going to build this new $10 billion ecosystem uh, that we're still working on. The state, most recently in our budget, put about a quarter of a billion dollars on top of all the money that's been spent up until now. And we think through the help of the federal government with the Infrastructure for America uh, funding that we can finish off the rest. And the, get this, the good part is, the local roads that we're helping out with and additional money on behalf on beyond beyond that's being done in about eight months time and we believe on the time schedule we're on uh, the remainder of that can be done in less than two years uh, with the ideal uh, completion Fantastic. date being before the fall of 2020 a date i'm sure you're interested in uh, that would be completed by that time and uh, we're thrilled and we think it's a good example of a good partnership between the federal the state and local governments and i just would add when, when you were coming in my friend from iowa uh, was just talking about uh, rural infrastructure and rural interest and i also want to say because we've got a good portion of our state that is rural as well. Not only thank you on a rural initiative for transportation, but particularly for broadband, we'd love to have, whether it's white spaces, fiber networks, you name it, uh, there's plenty of opportunities for us to grow and expand our internet uh, capacities all throughout the United States. Well, it's been very unfair what's happened with broadband in terms of the Middle West and in terms really of rural areas, as you know, and you sort of were a victim of it too, but now it's going to be taken care of. We're spending a great deal of money on that. It's only fair. And they want it. They want it. They know how to use it. They want it. 
and we're going to get it. How many jobs will be created because of Foxconn's new plant? About 35,000 in total. 13,000 direct, another 22,000 indirect or induced. And so it's how like would adding, you go there, about... That's bigger than just the direct jobs alone, 13,000, talking about rural, is bigger than 96% of all the municipalities in the state of Wisconsin. It's a fantastic thing. It's, everybody wanted Foxconn. Frankly, they weren't going to come to this country. I hate to say it, if I didn't get elected, they wouldn't be in this country. They would not have done this in this country. I think you know that very well. Uh, just out of curiosity, uh, 25,000, 35,000 jobs. It's a tremendous, one of the biggest economic development jobs in the country. How, how will you go about training and getting all of those people to work there? Well, the, f the first phase is, even before those jobs, is up to 10,000 construction jobs. So it fits in with exactly what you're talking about today. We'll have people all throughout our state and probably adjoining states. We made a major investment, and I think part of one of the visits, Ivanka, you had made to one of our technical colleges. We have all of our technical colleges colleges in the state are stepping up their programs specifically to train because this is not only for construction but then for high-tech advanced manufacturing this is going to be a whole new wave for us so we hope to have people not only in state being trained we're trying to recruit people from other states as well and the company will also train i understand absolutely that. they'll be bringing people that's in from so around exciting the world. scott congratulations you really did they told me the other day that you were really really great the state wisconsin I'm not surprised, but they did a great job, and you did a great job. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, adding to that, as you know, Apple, I told Tim Cook during the campaign before I was elected, I said, Tim, you know, I don't know if I'm going to make it or not, but if I do, you got to build plants. you got to build some big plants. I won't consider this a great success unless they see those big plants that I see all over China and other places, but in particular China. Hopefully, you're going to build them here. And he gave us a very big surprise two weeks ago, uh, $350 billion, not million, 300, $350 million would have been a nice plan, too. But he's going to invest $350 billion, of which he's taking $245 billion back. And that's the money we talked about coming back into this country. I think it's going to be about $4 trillion. It was $2.5 trillion, but I've been using that number for years, so I know the number's gotten larger. It's probably four. It could even be more than that. But a lot of it is coming back. Another company just announced they're bringing billions of dollars back into the country. But uh, Apple is bringing about $240 billion back in. They're going to build a tremendous campus. They're going to build new plants, and uh, it is beyond anything that anybody thought even possible. So that's very exciting. And you add that on to Foxconn, uh, it's a whole different world out there. So, Scott, thank you very much. Governor Martinez, I would like to uh, have you talk about some of the great strides that you've made in New Mexico and what we're doing and some of the things that are uh, happening, because that's a very exciting state, what's going on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. First, I'd like to start by thanking you for all that you've done and including our states through our mayors and governors and commissioners to be a part of the conversation. It was certainly something that did not exist in the previous administration. And because of that, um, we're at the table and able to give our different ideas and how they impact our states. Um, so I'm very, very grateful that for that, uh, for you, you and your uh, willingness to allow us to participate. Thank you, sir. Um, I also know that the tax reform that has taken place is bringing millions of dollars more into our state and with that comes the economic growth. And our economic growth, for example, we have just brought Facebook to New Mexico. Keep in mind, New Mexico is a 2.1 million population. <coughs> and to bring Facebook and the investment that they've brought with a 1,000 construction jobs, um, and of course have been preparing for those additional jobs with our community colleges and our um, two-year institutions and vocational school. So that making sure that the workforce was prepared to take on that number. Also, um, as you know, New Mexico is a very um, a big piece of our national security, as well as uh, we have natural resources, energy resources in New Mexico. And so our infrastructure is super important because we have what used to be two-lane highways for the amount of um, what we were developing in our energy sector, as well as our military bases and our national labs, now are requiring four lanes and possibly turning lanes because there's so much traffic, because the energy in the southeast, northwest, certain part of our state is, is so big and booming that we have private vehicles going and, and merging into those traffic. And unfortunately, right now, uh, can be very dangerous. And also, our national uh, 
We have the uh, waste infrastructure program down in the southeastern part of the state, bringing transuranic waste from the northern part of the state to the southeastern part of the state. And again, those very large trucks that are traveling on very narrow roads along with the public. And so again, thank you for including us so Great that we job. can be a big part of that. Our funding has certainly been private, public, and um, national infrastructure dollars coming together. We've been insisting on that for the last seven years because we don't want a single source of funding taking care of our needs. And so we're constantly asking when there is a project to be put together is what is the city putting in, county putting in, private sector putting in, federal putting in, state putting in, so that together we can begin a project and complete it. Well, great job you've done. Thank you, sir. To the people of New Mexico. I will. They've been Thank terrific. You, sir. Thank you very much, Susanna. One of the things we're doing, a little bit separate from this meeting, but it all sort of amounts to the same thing, is a reciprocal tax. We are going to charge countries outside of our country, countries that take advantage of the United States. Some of them are so-called allies, but they're not allies on trade. Uh, they'll send in their product, and we won't charge them anything. And we send them our product, same product as they're sending us, and they'll charge us 50 and 75 percent tax. And that's very unfair. One of the examples, Scott, is Harley-Davidson. They're, they're treated very unfairly in various countries. You know the countries I'm talking about. So we're going to be doing very much a reciprocal tax, and you'll be hearing about that during the week and during the coming months, but uh, not fair when we're taken advantage of. That's why we have these big trade deficits. That's why we have tremendous problems with trade. We're, as you know, renegotiating NAFTA now. I always said we're either going to renegotiate it or terminate it. We're renegotiating. That lasts.